And Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends. I'm your host, Ray Shasho. Since the release of their self-titled debut album in 2019, L.A.-based quartet, the pattern-seeking animals have been one of the Prague scene's most prolific outfits formed from members of the influential group Spock's Beard, pattern-seeking animals, has staked claim to its own identity, forging a new path in the Prague scene. Uh, named after a quote about human behavior from science historian Michael Shermer, PSA is uh, John Beghold on uh, keyboards and production, Ted Leonard on lead vocals and guitar, bassist David Merrows, and the energetic and talented Jimmy Keegan on drums. Beghold, known for his Film scores and innovative prog compositions initially formed the group due to the desire to find a home for material that was not quite the right fit for Spock's beard. Sessions took place with Leonard, Miros, and Keegan, and PSA was born. Ever since, the group has been creating music that is progressive and intricate while keeping things immediate and melodic. With critically acclaimed albums, the group's new release... Spooky action at a distance continues to build on the band's prior successes while branching out into new territory. The group has long put to rest that this is a part-time project. Spooky action um, at a distance finds pattern-seeking animals more confident than ever, approaching new soundscapes and topics combined with the DNA of their previous work for their most memorable and powerful album to date. Please welcome the lyricist for Prog Rock Spock's Beard and keyboardist, songwriter, composer, singer for Prog Rock Supergroup Pattern Seeking Animals, John Beckhold, to interviewing the legends. Hello, John. Hello. How's it going? We're doing good, man. Where Very are good. you anyway? Are you in California? Uh, LA. Uh, okay. More specifically, Studio City, California, which is just one city above Hollywood. Oh, okay. I've been to LA once, and we oh, stayed yeah. at the uh, Century Plaza Hotel. Oh yeah, nice hotel. Is it still there? Century City. Yeah, you know, I, I would imagine it is. Who yeah, knows? I haven't Century been in that City. area in a while. <laughs> I haven't been there in a while. <laughs> that part of town, Century City. Yeah. It used to be right across from the Playboy um, nightclub. There's some right. club there. Yeah, and yeah, a- I think ago. the ABC Entertainment Center was there yep. as well. I've, I've been there as I remember, but it's been a long time. So buildings yeah. come and go around here, and I never. I know. know. So. Oh, yeah. They do too here as well. Yeah. Well, you guys got now three singles videos released from the new album. Four. Is that right? Oh, four. four. I missed yeah, one. Four. Yeah, because on on release day maybe it got overshadowed. Uh, okay. On release day on the October twenty seventh, we also released a video for "Clouds That Never Rain." Which right. Is the fourth single. But okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I, got, I, I had think... uh, underneath the orphan. I thought was the last one, but I guess not. Yeah, underneath the orphan moon. Uh, yeah, I think Clouds Never Rain, just because the whole album was released that day, it kind of got, not buried, but it didn't get as much attention. But it's there for anyone who wants to see it. All the videos are great, man. Love it. Oh, cool. And I told you before, I love the album. <laughs> oh, great. That's good. <laughs> the subject matter of the lyrics include a Norse king contemplating life while being conquered, an aging seeker on the path toward enlightenment, aliens hunting down humans trying to evade capture, the life of a con- conflicted soldier before and after World War I, a pregnant teen- teenager uh, leaving a bad situation at home, a reluctant hero victorious in her final battle, and a guy's girlfriend who leaves him because of his conspiracy theories. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you did all that? Yeah, just uh, different <laughs> things have popped into my head as I'm running lyrics. I try and you know shake things up and uh, not go too far down the same road on different songs you know um uh, just trying to make things sound different so well you certainly did <laughs> thanks here's what i said about the album um the artistic matureness and proudness of these four proficient music vets that call themselves pattern seeking animals is distinctive uh pronounced on their sublime new release spooky action at a distance the album has all the musical elements needed to become a bona fide classic. And I said it was five cool. stars. Cool. I can yeah, we, we, that. we love that. It's great, man. And we said, we talked about this before. 
spooky action at a distance. Einstein. Right. Yeah, it was um I, I was watching this I watched a series on YouTube by a German physicist named Sabine Hassenfelder. She has like a million a million followers, is very popular, and she, she gets on once or twice a week and discusses everything, physics, science, astronomy, whatever, in a little closer to layman's terms. And I was I'm always interested in quantum physics and quantum mechanics, quantum entanglement, <clears throat> only because I I don't understand it. You know, my brain gets about 90% there. And then I just, it just never clicks with me. So anytime I see something about that, I'll watch it and hope one day that little light bulb will go off in my head and it'll say, oh, of course, this is what I'm talking about. It's very frustrating. But um, yeah, and one of the lines she, she was talking about, it was Albert Einstein talking about quantum entanglement in a letter to another physicist. And there's something that wasn't right about it from Einstein, and he described it in the original German, translated to spooky action at a distance. And the minute I heard that, I just thought, oh, that's that's a great album title, because I've been coming, trying to come up with other album titles, and just everything was boring to me, and it wasn't working, and nothing clicked. But I just thought, okay, that's a cool title. So that's where that came from. I, I'm like you when it comes to physics, you know. Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> oh, I know. It sounds like something I'd love to be able to understand, and I do yeah. to a certain level. But there's right. an extra five or ten percent. It just never clicks with me. You know, maybe one day before I, you know, shuffle out this mortal coil, it'll actually, <laughs> it'll actually make sense. That's why I liked watching the Big Bang Theory. You know, I'm I'm yeah. hoping to capture some things that you know yeah. they're they're saying but yeah yeah know. they're just some people whose minds connect with that type of thing right. and i guess i'm just not one of them i think they were born that way you know some oh, yeah. people are just yeah. super intelligent when they're born you know yeah and the synapses in their brain work in a different way and yeah uh, I, don't know. I don't know who knows but yeah that was I, a yeah i'm like you know, i'm very interested in the subject string theory yeah. and all that stuff oh yeah 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 Another and again, one I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pattern seeking yeah. animals is another kind of thing. Very interesting. Well, that's, um, yeah, that's one I understand. Right. Uh, because it's the Michael Shermer quote. I'm not sure if anyone mm -hmm. used it before him, but it's just that we need to, as humans to evolve, we seek out patterns. You know, if you're, if you're a caveman in the forest and you know that every, every time of the year when the moon is at this certain, you know, level, the deer come by or whatever you start thinking in terms of those patterns. So you'll be able to know when to hunt. And, and we also look for patterns in things that don't exist. Oh, look at those stars in the sky. Oh, that looks like a swan, you know, even though it's, it's not, you know, whatever that's yeah, who our minds are built like that. I'm, I'm intrigued by, um, see, I never understood atheists because of everything that's happened in this world. They, they think it's by accident. I don't think so. Yeah. Because if it was, we would burn up number one, the sun is just at the right distance for us. The moon is just at the right distance from us. Our solar system is just right. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's too many things that are, you know. Yeah, I'm kind of like one step. I'm somewhere between agnostic and atheist. Uh, I, atheist to me is like another religion. Right. You know, they know that everything. And I, I can't do that because how how do you know that? I guess scientifically you could say, well, you have to prove something if you make if you make a claim. But I think there are just a lot of unknowable things, not things that we might someday know. I think there's just a lot of things we'll never know. And uh, so then just live your life. And there you go. There you go. Yeah. But what what's, uh, fascinates me, and I'll say God because, you yeah. know, or it or whatever made this uh, huge, massive, you know, space and in our lifetime, of course, we're not going to be able to explore it all. And, yeah. and, but I'm thinking maybe one, it was meant there because maybe one day man will, and we're yeah. just kind of like in the dinosaur age right now. I don't know. It's just, yeah. I, I always, I always looked at it. Like <laughs> I always, I have friends who say the most fantastic thing would be finding, you know, aliens from other planets, right. which would be, which would obviously be interesting. But to me, the more existential, concept is how everything came to be right I, I, I think if there are people or whatever on other planets life form it's probably true it probably is and that would be fascinating to find out about but the real existential question is how everything got here that's exactly the real thing. you know so yeah. yeah i get it i get it yeah you know we don't concentrate enough on that you would think we would put more studies in on what happens after we die what yeah. happened before we were born yeah 
You know, I mean, we were tadpoles, man. Oh, yeah. Little bit, <laughs> tiny little tadpoles. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because um, I'm not religious at all. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm interested in Buddhism as kind of a, a, more of a, uh, a method of living life. But right. It's not really in the religious sense. And I tend to write lyrics which have a lot of religious imagery. Uh, and people come to me and say, oh, yeah, he's he's born again. He's he's the whatever. He's with, he's this and that. And I said, no, I just, you know, because I've read all the book, the Bible. I've read every, you know, every the, the Bible, the, you know, the Torah, the, the Quran. I've read all that stuff. Good for you. Past. Good for you. And I just like forget about whether it's I believe any of it or some of it or whatever. The imagery in the writing is so cool and it so is, great just just stylistically I, I i love the imagery so when i write these things which sound like i'm coming from a spiritual standpoint people say oh yeah you're you're you know whatever and i say no i i i just think it sounds cool <laughs> you know I think, yeah yeah i think it's a cool image there there are so many people that are turned off from religion because of the evangelist that yeah. go nuts and ask for money and it's and, and you know that's not what it's all about yeah. you know I, you it know, really isn't it, to each their own, you know, it's whatever yeah. people believe it's fine. I have no, sure. no problem. It's, it's all good. It's all good. I saw a, I, I forgot where I was in Orlando somewhere, but they had a, a collection of very old Bibles. I mean, uh -huh. from way back from the early times and yeah. the way they wrote back then, the very whole different. Bible by hand was incredible and beautiful yeah. penmanship, you know? Oh, yeah. Yes. It was fascinating really fasc stuff. Very fascinating stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I do believe in aliens just so you know. Yeah. Well, I'm sure. Yeah. I don't know if I believe in them, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if something is out there because just just the numbers. Yeah. You know, just the tens of trillions of stars out there. It's just just logically there's something out there. Somewhere. Sure. Yeah. I, I had this conversation with Chris Squire many. Oh, really? Ago. Yeah. It and was. he said uh, the aliens are us from the future. <laughs> yeah. You know, at, the older I get, I. I wouldn't, you know, are we living in a simulation? Who knows? <laughs> you know, the strange, just things get strange sometimes. And, and you think, oh, something doesn't click. Something just doesn't click about this or that. And, and there's just, like I said, you know, to back, back to the beginning of the conversation, there are just some things which we don't know and we can't know. Mm -hmm. And we're not allowed to know, I guess. We're not allowed, or we're, whoever, whatever reason, we don't. Yeah. And um, uh, so, yeah, just live your life with that knowledge. But and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 The Matrix yeah. blew me away. I sometimes think we're, we are in the Matrix. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. <laughs> Things are all upside down right now. Oh, yeah. I'm going to talk about some tracks. Um, the, sure. the Man Made of Stone, you know, very prog. Love the violins in that, of course. Um, to, you know, the drum roll intro. Uh, it's a great, great tune. Oh, really thanks. good tune. Yeah, that, um, that was yeah. That one is uh, that's one of my favorites on the album. Really, just yeah, especially because the way the vocals turn out in the center section and some other things, which I thought you know clicked and gelled really nicely on that song. Windows to the world is uh, should be a hit, and I, I said this before. It's a uh, kind of prog pop. Yeah, uh, could be definitely be a top forty hit. Back in the MTV days, that would have been. You know, one of the top yeah. ten. Not you know? now. Not not now. It's it's funny because right. people always say, "Yeah, it's like pop structure into writing pop," and I actually listen to current pop. I've never mm -hmm. stopped. I just listen to all the current stuff. I always have. And I said that can only be said by someone who hasn't listened to an actual pop station in twenty years, <laughs> because it, it's so different and everything is so different now. Which I I love a lot of the stuff out there now, but. It, it may be, you know, Window to the World may be a pop format that is, mm -hmm. that is a shorter song, but it's, yeah, these days there's, there's there's no conceivable way that would end up on a, you know, on a chart. <clears throat> it's a shame, you know, I was a top 40 DJ back in the late 70s. Oh, yeah. so, and yes, I love top 40 music since yeah, the yeah. 60s, you know. Same. It's a, yeah. Yeah, started and with it, the monkeys. It, oh, yeah. It's very different now, though, isn't it? It, it is. It's very different, and people say, "Oh, you know, a lot of people my age just say, oh, they don't make, you know, they're not making good music like the '70s.' You no, know, they're making great music today. It's just that they're maybe doing in methods you haven't kept up with right, that don't appeal right. to you, because um, there was a lot of crap when we were kids. And True, there's some crap True. now, but there is just some tremendous songs and songwriting and production 
stuff happening in, in pop music, which I which I absolutely love. Who do you like nowadays, anyway? Um, I like uh, boy a lot of things. I, I want to just open up my Spotify while I you know. I, uh, I like uh, uh, there's a girl group called Flow, which is a three piece R and B group. Great oh, songs. really? Yeah, her, yeah, F L O. I like love R and B. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like um, uh, I like the uh, uh, Niall Horan, who is I guess a pop star along with Harry Styles, who was mm -hmm. in One Republic or whatever. Um, Taylor Swift, I love. I absolutely love Taylor Swift. The Weeknd, uh, Zed. Uh, Doja Cat, I like her, David Guetta. Um, and then I like a lot of K-pop stuff because uh, the, the songs and just the energy of that, groups like Espa or New Jeans, um, uh, Le Seraphim, you know, just all sorts of stuff, wide variety. Uh, uh, J-pop, there's a couple, there's a lot of great music being done these days for anime and games, like tremendous songs. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's like that Coldplay song, you know, if I could rule the world, da, da, right. da, that was from a, you know, a big game and that's how it became so popular. Um, but Otto and Emma, the two female singers who do singing for a lot of uh, anime in Japan, just tremendously great rock stuff. And, uh, but no one hears it here. No one hears it, which I understand because it sounds real different. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, but you know, Miley Cyrus, I love her. She's just turns out with great songs all the time. Uh, like I said, the weekend, but no, it's just a, a t there's a ton of great stuff out there right now. Believe it or not, I like uh, Ariana Grande. Oh, she's great. <laughs> oh yeah, positions that song she had a couple years ago. I love that song. She's so uh, talented. She really is. And I I used to watch her when she was me and my wife used to watch her when she was cat on Nickelodeon. You know? Oh right, she was in that kitchen. Yeah right. <laughs> she's really funny. No, she she's 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 super talented yeah and again it's just an age thing it's like i think you what happens is that you know people my age i don't know how old you are i'm 66 just about to be 67 people I'll my be 65 age, yeah. yeah so we're in the same ballpark yep. um you know you know people listen to new stuff and they go oh these kids are not making anything and i i have to remind them you know when we were teenagers the people making great music were in their early 20s yeah. You know, it's not that it's we're listening to, we weren't listening to a bunch of 50 year olds. I remember seeing Genesis a few times back when I was a teenager and they were like 21 or something like yeah. that. And you forget that's where there's an explosion of talent in and after your teenage years mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, and so a lot of crap because people go off into these directions and it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But then there's these really unique things before you get before you get set into your ways as far as stylistically or what sounds you like or whatever where something just comes off the wall but is just tremendously you know great music and uh there's a lot of it out there but uh yeah so it's, yeah in early years and, and eventually in your late 20s and 30s as a musician you just start to get set in your ways and i try mm -hmm. and fight that all along um because i could i could sit around writing you know, writing prog music, you know, like Yes and Genesis from the 70s, which I could because I love all that. St I absolutely love all that stuff. But artistically, I don't really feel a need to do that. Mm -hmm. There's so many other people who do it well and uh, better than I could. You should write a, uh, a top 40 hit in today's standards, you know. I bet you can do that. Oh, I've, I've, I have a couple songs I've written with, to, yeah, the production value. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing. It's a very different way things are produced these days. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not just talking about songs, you know, the, the, the sounds of everything, but the structure of songs and the length. Yeah. The, the bass and drums are very different in pop songs today than they were 20 or 30 years ago. So it's mm -hmm. a very, a very different thing, but I love the current production ideas and uh, no, I can, I can switch into that very easily. Yeah. Yeah. I used to like Britney Spears a lot. Oh Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and believe it or not, I loved the Spice Girls when they came out. They I was a big fan. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's all it's you know, to me. It's like the old thing: song is king. The song mm -hmm. is king, and if it's a great song, I don't care. I don't even care how well you're singing it. You know, it's like the old question: Would you rather hear a fantastic singer doing you know average material, or an average singer doing fantastic material? And I'm going with the average singer any day of the week. Yep. any day uh, i agree yeah the song is everything yeah and uh i i think uh um 
if you have that in mind, and some people don't. I, I know people who listen to music and if they don't like the singer, they can't even get into it. Yeah, true. And I, you know, and which I don't understand, but it's, it's fine. However you, you know, look at music is fine, but yeah, not me. It doesn't, doesn't matter to me. Well, we were very lucky growing up because the sixties top 40 radio had R and B bubble oh, yeah. gum. Uh, it had Frank Sinatra. It had, it, yeah. it had everybody on one radio station. So it was very oh, yeah. eclectic and you got to hear everything and pick and choose, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and I remembered like the first singles I ever bought as a kid, it was like uh painted black rolling stones. I remember really? buying like, I remember buying four singles right when the monkeys came out, mm -hmm. uh, like in 66. Uh, and I remember the first songs I bought were Paint It Black, Mellow Yellow, and then uh, They're Coming to Take Me Away, which yeah. is a novelty song, you know, on, the, on AM at the time. Yeah. Um, I, my first 45, I think, was uh, The Purple People Eater by Chef oh, Wooly. Yeah. Chef Wooly, yeah. <laughs> remember that? Uh, Finally, Purple People Eater. Then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, and I think yeah. the twist was after that. And then yeah. I got into the Beatles and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, what awaits me had an awesome guitar in that. It was an incredible prog track. It really was. Really like that track. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's that's a cool one. I especially like, you know, that bass line. Doom, doom, do, do. Yep. Dave, Dave, uh, he's been playing. He has this old Mossrite '60s bass, which is not a great shape, but it has such a distinct sound. Mm -hmm. He's done a few tracks in this album. I really like when he plays. You know, the flat wand strings. Um. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What a waste me. I think that was about the first one I wrote for the album too. That and Man Made of Stone, I started working on at the same time for the album. How long did it take you to write all these songs? Well, see, some of them, I don't, I think like a lot of writers are like this. Um, there are some songs when I go to start an album, which I may have had been sitting around for years, mm -hmm. but never, I never finished or whatever. Right. And I always go through my big list, you know, my big iTunes file list and, and think, okay, I'm going to listen to all this. Cause I have hundreds of little musical ideas. You know, some are just me going, da -da 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 that'd be a cool chorus, you know, whatever, just stuff like that. But then there's some, which are more fleshed out real songs. So I go through them and sometimes looking for things that, um, I think would would I'd like to finish or make a good song, um, uh, but a lot of them I just write from scratch and never use that. And there's a few couple songs in the album which are older songs which never work for me in the beginning. They've been around for years, and I look. I've done this for all the albums, and again, I, I think everyone does this too. Um, I looked at it after so much time had gone by and realized, oh yeah. I can make this work completely where I just didn't have the, whatever is the time or I didn't have the musical chops back right. then to do it. <clears throat> and all of a sudden everything would click uh, to, Oh, I can do the bridge in this key and that would work now into the chorus, you know? And um, so there's a few songs like that, but uh, most of it was written from scratch. I would mm -hmm. just sit down and start playing, you know, the keyboard or a guitar or whatever, and just start building it up. Did you see the, uh, <clears throat> the video about the Beatles new single that they have I've, coming out i watched a little of it yeah i heard the single thing. very interesting I, because it's exactly what you're saying you know they they tried to separate the piano from john's voice yeah. they couldn't do it in the beginning and they kind of just we can't do it they left it alone for years and years yeah and then and they the got technology. the energy to because of the technology to finally get it done which is really cool y yeah it's it's interesting on a nostalgia level but right as a tune you know some things are best left as demos to me. <laughs> I, I know. I, you know i it's just you know if you were to play it and not know it was the beatles you think oh this is some you know uh you know 20 year old power pop band trying to do a version of the trying to sound like the beatles or something yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't really it, it's kind of a, oddly recorded and i think that has to do with trying to separate his voice from the other instruments but as a song it doesn't do much for me but part of that you know, if you take your, 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 I always say this when you, if you, if you take like, take it, what's a favorite album of yours from when you were a teenager? Just oh, Dark Side I mean, of the Moon. <laughs> Dark Side of the Moon. Okay. Roger Waters comes out today and says, you know what? We had another song for Dark Side of the Moon. It was our absolute favorite song. We were about to uh, 
it was we had it recorded it was going to be our killer song of that album and the date we came to to put the album together we lost the tapes right we absolutely lost the tapes we looked everywhere and we ran out of time and we figured we'd just do it for another album it just never for whatever reason never came around but we were just someone is just going through the old studio and found the taste behind a wall you know not not ironically speaking the wall found a wall you know when they were tearing down the building and we have this song that we were going to release it they could release it and it may be fantastic and it sounds like it should have been on that album but it's not going to have any of the same emotional impact it's just not going to have that you know you mm-hmm. listen to those songs you listen to uh great gig in the sky and mm-hmm. all of a sudden you're back to, to a place you lived when you were 18 or whatever it yeah. all conjures up these memories and emotions and nostalgia which a song from that time which wasn't released at that time would never have even though it might be a killer song so i, I agree. think that's yeah yeah that's a lot of it yeah i mean you know roger waters just did <laughs> The Dark Side of the Moon album all over I, again. It, big mistake. I, I can't even bring. I mean, the guy just <laughs> seems to be such a, a, a fan, you know, an, a, an astounding a hole about yeah. everything. I, I can't even bring myself <laughs> just to listen to anything he does these days. And I'm I can't just, either. I'm a big Gilmore fan, of course. And, oh, yeah, and, I'm on Team Dave Gilmore all the time. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. And I loved Richard Wright. You know, he oh, was. Yeah. He didn't get enough credit, you know, because no, without him, there would be no Pink Floyd. <laughs> no, he wasn't. He wasn't flashy, but that's the yeah. kind of keyboard players like him and Tony Banks, right? And uh, Nick Rhodes from Duran Duran, guys yep. who weren't flashy with all the solos, but had great ways of orchestrating their parts and uh, counter melodies and cool melodies and stuff within the music. Yeah, Richard Wright, man, that guy was just had just monster jazz chops within the within the uh, the Pink Floyd music, which I always loved his playing. Yeah, the piano and the organ and everything. And the spaciness that was him. Oh, yeah. It was all him. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Oh, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, he once was. Wow, yeah. what a you know. It builds into this epic type of music. You know, it. it I said this before. It's a concept album within a single track. You know, yeah. and there's a kind of a Pink Floyd type saxophone in it. It had a great ending. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's that's one of those tunes like we talked. The beginning part of that is a very simple melody, da 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 da, da. and three chords, and I've had that around for ten years. That just that melody and the piano and the chords for that, I was never able to fit it into a song, but I always loved it, and I kept singing, mm-hmm. thinking this could be cool in the right. I've tried tried the last few albums, I tried it, whatever, and finally this year I was playing it and automatically went to the next section and thought, okay, I'm going to be able to make this work. <laughs> so I was finally able to. <laughs> and originally it was that song was only going to be maybe five or six minutes max. But as I'd finished one section, something else would come up that really worked for me. So I just kept going. And by the time it got to that point where the sax comes in, I I was think I, I thought, I want to do something surprising here that we, people wouldn't expect so i got this great sax player named alex bone to uh english guy young young guy it's like 21 Hmm. or something but super talented player and he lives in london to do it remotely and because the music there sounded like we said like kind of a pink floyd vibe or or super tramp you know a lot of groups back then dire straits whatever would have a sax pop in now and then um and i went with it which is interesting because sax in prog music is pretty divisive Mm-hmm. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I'm on the, I love sax. I you know? love it, man. Yeah. So but there are some, <laughs> there's two guys in the band who, who, who ooh, that's say, you can't put sax in this. It doesn't work. And then me and Dave loved it. But um, uh, Frank, the engineer was yeah, midway between it, but most of the people like it. But as I, as I know from being a prog fan forever, sax always, you know, <laughs> people, you know, take, take your corner. You're on one side or the other with yeah, exactly. sax and prog music. Yeah. I mean, King Crimson, Camel. I mean, all, oh, oh you know. yeah, King Crimson with uh, uh, the sax with the soprano sax and the yep. and, uh, Camel, the flute, yep. the sax. Yeah, there's a ton of them back then. Incredible. Yeah. All right, I got to ask you: Did you name this title? Because this title is fantastic. Clouds that never rain. I mean, was that you? Uh, 
I don't remember because that's a song which has been around for a long time. I wrote with uh, the vocalist who was in my band, in fact, with Dave Maros at the time. Yep. She and I wrote that song years ago, or, or the basis of it. We never released it. I, I can't huh. remember. We put it on one of our demos at one point, our demo albums. But a very, it was a very, very, very different version. And I I like the basis of it, so I rewrote the song around it for Pattern Seek Animals. But the, the actual title... I don't remember if it was her or me that came up with it because we would just sit there and we'd, you know, brainstorm back and forth with lyrics, but it might have been me. It might have been her. I don't it's remember. It's a great title, man. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, there's so many titles out there. It's hard to not, you know, sound like another title. And I've never heard yeah. this title before. It's it's totally different. Yeah. It's great. I, a, a lot of times with songs, with titles, if I if they start to sound too corny or cliche to me, I always do a Google search. Yeah. And there are some titles you, you do it, you go on BMI or ASCAP and there's 700 other songs with the exact <laughs> same title. But if I can do it, so there's maybe one or two other ones, only the two that have used it, I think, okay, it's unique. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm going to go with it. I, I like the, uh, it's it kind of has elements of 70s and 80s rock, you know, in in, in, the, in the sound. Um, yeah, yeah. And I like Dave's bass. Yeah, Dave. Dave, um, yeah, he was in the band we did it originally. Yeah, his really? bass tone. Yeah, his his um, his bass. You know, I've known Dave for forty years. Really, he's been pretty much the only bass player I've ever worked with, <laughs> other than one or two gigs I had to do with someone. You know, but he, he's been involved with ninety nine percent of the music I've done for anyone ever. So, mm. um, no, his yeah, he plays that really well, and he has a really cool tone on that bass. It really moves that song around. I agree. I like Dave. Dave, I saw Dave live. I think playing with Eric Burden a long oh, yeah. time ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent bass player. Oh yeah. Um, Bulletproof. That's another top forty hit back in the day because it kind of reminded me of a Todd Rundgren composition. You know, in a way. You know. Oh, absolutely. That one was originally done on a Spox for a, the last Spox Beard record in twenty eighteen. Oh. Huh. It ended, but it ended up on the bonus disc and the version that was done. I was just, let's just say I was not a fan of for various reasons. I just didn't mm -hmm. like the way it turned out. Right. And I thought, well, since it only ended up on the bonus disc, which is like a ghetto of music, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, people bonus songs, people listen to them <laughs> once or twice and that's it. And then they just go into that, you know, that great, uh, the great black hole of, of, uh, of, of bonus disc songs in the sky. <laughs> uh, so uh, because it's one of the favorite songs I've written of mine, you know, in the past 20 years, I've, I kept thinking, I just, I want to do this again, the way I really hear it. Right. And uh, yeah, Todd Rundgren. Yeah. It has those kind of changes, mm -hmm. uh, has some kind of Motown changes, some Todd Rundgren ish type of things. But again, it's something where I'm just, because it's one of my favorite songs, I, I just wanted to do it and have a version I liked whether or not, uh, other people liked it, you know, what, fine. But I, but I just didn't like the idea of it just sitting there, you know. Came out great. Love it. Right. Cool. Like I said, it could be a top, it's on my top 40 list, by the way. Cool. <laughs> cool. Um, somewhere north of nowhere. I, we chatted about this song before. Little yeah. Rush sounding. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's. I, I don't necessarily hear Rush in that, but other really? people have said that, which I'll take it because I, I was a huge Rush fan. Yeah. I'm just a massive Rush fan. So I'll take it. I'm sure some of that. So other people have said that one sounds a bit like Yes, which again, a little bit I'll, like take, yes. yep. uh, I'll take that because I was a mm -hmm. huge Yes fan. So no doubt those influences pop up in my writing. I don't hear it, but that doesn't mean anything because, you know, if other people hear it, that's cool. I, that's I'm, a good thing. It's yeah. a good thing. Oh, yeah. It's always a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Especially that Rush isn't around anymore. You know, people are yeah. still starving for more Rush uh, sounds, I guess. And yeah. uh, the no final. Ever, mm -hmm. oh, I was saying, yeah, with Rush, no one's really been taking that mantle of the type of stuff they've done. A lot of people have tried to do a Rush type thing, and it just. No. Uh, it just never works because Rush was a, it was a unique Very group unique. of players and writers. Yep. And uh, it's not something that's easy to duplicate. Well, it's like Jethro Tull. Nobody will ever <laughs> replicate yeah, right. Jethro yeah. Tull. It's impossible. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's unique. You hear him, and it's just yeah. that singular, one-of-a-kind voice and yep. the flute playing and the the way he writes, Ian Anderson. Yeah. Yep. 
last two songs summoned from afar um reminded me a little bit of a yacht sound you know yacht rock kind of <laughs> yacht rock prog yeah the, the <laughs> <New> second, <genre. laughs> the, second the, the second half of that song i, I switched to a, a completely different vibe of the first half right and i always heard it as like it sounded to me like a santana song mm-hmm. it, but it could be that vibe it has a, it has the congas happening and uh I, I told Ted, I said, okay, just go for guitar, which if, let's say if you were playing on a Santana track, even though it really doesn't sound like Santana, but in my brain, that's what I was hearing. But uh, yeah, the Yacht Rock thing, a lot of people would look at that as a pejorative, but I take that as a compliment because I, I used to love all those. I used to go see those concerts with, you know, Pablo Cruz and yeah. all those, all those groups, Ambrosia, all those groups back then I would yep. go and see. I love that kind of music. So. Me too. I love Firefall, yeah. man. Firefall. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I've interviewed all the guys from Firefall, Orleans, oh, cool. you know. Orleans. Yeah. I love yeah. Orleans. All those, those groups. Guys. Are, yeah. Great. Yeah. Yep. You finish off with Love is Still the Light. Uh, beautiful. Yeah beautiful song on slower slower track slower ballad yeah yeah that one is another one i wrote with diane you know years mm-hmm. ago the same one i wrote with clouds and never rain with and um again it, it, it completely rewritten from back in the day it's right. not even the same title there's certain things which are the same but it's it's you know 90 percent new that one and it seemed like the natural way to close off the album yep and of course, CD two is all live stuff from Prog Stock from twenty twenty two, and also uh, the um, uh, "There Goes My Baby" is on there. The goes on the, yep. yeah. Although that will be on the main album of the single U.S. release, okay, of the of the one CD version without the live. So that'll be on the the, the U.S. version. Too I'm, I'm assuming you have a lot of music built up for the next album. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because. Um, this album we turned in, it was finished, I'm thinking, April of mm-hmm. 2023. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, there's, you know, there's six months till the album comes out. And I, I'm writing all the time. So I'm, I started writing right after that one was done. And I'm like, I'm about halfway into the new album, the next number five. Awesome. So, yeah, not just because I, even if I didn't mm-hmm. have something to do it for, I, I just love writing. I have a little mm-hmm. studio. You can't see it because it's blurred out. It's right behind me. But um, uh, no, I just love writing. Love it. How would you like to be like the the next? I don't know, Lou Adler or uh, you know that kind of guy that produces a lot of you know finds new talent. You know the problem is with that. It, I don't. That's not really me. In the past, I have produced a few things for other people, right? Or, and written for other people, but I. I turn. I just stopped with all of that only because in the hierarchy of things I like to do, writing my own stuff and producing my own stuff is to me, the, the, mo- the most passion I have is for doing that. Right. And the older you get, you start thinking, you know, I got, only got so many years left on this planet. Why am I going to do, why am I going to work on stuff, which I don't really feel, mm-hmm. um, you know, obviously if something comes along, which is incredibly artistically cool, I would, yeah, I could go with it or, or something which paid so much money, I couldn't turn it down. Sure. But as far as you know, doing create, being, being creative, my own stuff is really what I want to work on at this point. They were, we're kind of missing the pioneers, you know, uh-huh. that, that we used to have back in the day, you know, those guys, guys like that, Don Kirshner, you know, right. Found Kansas people State. that really made a difference and, you know, cr- created Did, and yeah. found Did, these, Dick Clark. Great bands. Uh, yeah. Um, no, but yeah, Don Kirsten, I mean, you know, Kansas, that's a perfect yeah. example. He was, he was a guy who found Kansas. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> um, touring. When is, is the band going to tour, especially to promote this album? Um, we did a tour. First of all, I don't play in a live group. Okay. Um, um, because I've just never liked playing live. Why? And also, <laughs> I just never, I just never liked it. It was never my thing. I'm more at home and comfortable in a studio as a, as a songwriter. I consider myself a songwriter, not necessarily. I play enough keyboards to write with. I play enough guitars to write with. Right. Um, But I'm nowhere near as good as the other guys in the band. I don't think I could play most of the stuff I write, uh, you know, technically. Hmm. Um, uh, And since I don't like it and, you know, and I, I don't think I'm good enough to do it just, 
just from a you know play musicianship angle um the band gets two other people you know dave ted and jimmy we have another guy um uh, dennis atlas who plays keyboards fantastic young keyboard player and then uh, walter eno who's been in you know the babies and all those other groups he plays mm -hmm. uh he does uh uh, he's like a utility guy. He'll play keyboards, guitars, mandolin. He sings. So with with those two, then the other three guys in the band. Right. We did the, we did uh, last year? We did the cruise to the edge. Right. And Roz Fest, and then Prague Stock. Yep. Right now we're we're looking to line some things up. Nothing solid at the moment. Uh, you know, the problem is it gets tougher and tougher for a band to tour. Yeah. Uh, just financially and logistically, it gets really tough. Uh, so we're trying to line a few things up and also it seems like every year there's more and more of these type of you know prog bands or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call them out there you know vying for the same place on on uh you know in festivals or the cruise or stuff like that so it becomes a numbers game yeah that's so we're, true. we're yeah we're trying to work on a couple things and i'd love to get the band out there playing again uh, hopefully in 2024 mm -hmm. and as soon as we do we'll we'll uh announce it you guys would do so well overseas too in Europe and well, you know, uh, they uh, love Prague. Oh yeah. You know? We've looked again, we've looked into that and there's a lot of groups, you know, yeah. flower Kings, I think are touring right now and Riverside yep. and, and whatever. Um, but to make money doing it or not go out of pocket is really tough with the expenses these days. Yeah. You, you, you um, you have to spend so much money and I don't think we have a big enough following to do it on our own at this point, even though mm -hmm. everyone in the band has been around and people kind of know us. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not like, uh, like again, like flower Kings who has what a 30 year, um, history. Mm -hmm. I love the flower Kings by the way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and so they have this built up, you know, with Royna being in transatlantic and the, you know, the, it's, you know, it's a great band. And so they have a, a built up fan base, which they can go out and do that. Um, we just haven't, built that up we have some real loyal fans but i don't think we have enough to to fill a place by ourselves so we've also been looking into maybe touring with another group or something yeah. but there's a lot of options we're, we're we're just trying to uh mm -hmm. you know trying to explore i had uh <clears throat> rob reed on yesterday from magenta yeah and also and, and of course they have they're bringing back um cyan the band cyan which is incredible Australian um, band. They're Australian, are they? Cyan is that? No, they're actually UK. Oh, UK. Are they UK. Yeah. Doesn't, uh, Pete Jones play with them. Yeah, Pete. Pete, yeah, who he also plays. plays with Camel. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. He's the keyboard player. Yeah, exactly. No, he's he, an incredible musician. Pete Jones man. is is an un, you know supernaturally talented guy. You it's know, unbelievable. Just, yeah, he yeah. really is. No matter what, I remember hearing uh, one of his albums he came out with like four or five years ago when I first heard him. And I kept thinking, oh, geez, I wonder who's, uh, I knew he played keyboards. Well, who's, he's a great keyboard player. Wow, I wonder who's playing the sax. It's really good. I wonder who's exactly. playing the guitar. He's, he's, whoever this guitar player is, is ripping. Turns out it's all him. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, he's, he's great. Yeah, he blew me away. Like you said, he was playing keyboards. And then on one of the songs, he pulls out the sax. And, yeah. you know, he's, he's equally as talented in, yeah. in all, his, all these instruments, which is yeah, incredible. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yep. Well, I'd like to. I'd love to see you guys in concert. I think, it, especially this album, it would be wonderful to see see you yeah. guys play that live. Yeah. yeah. You I should agree. be. You should be writing though, for other people as well, and uh, you know, you be, make so much money, man. <laughs> well, I have. I have like pops. I have a publisher, and I have some right. things because I've written pop and country in the past. I every once in a while I put something together, and I right. I have a few things I'm putting together for to show to the publisher in the next few months. Okay. Um, but writing for other people, it's, it's real. It's again, it just doesn't give me the same, uh, the same jolt that doing it for my own project does. Uh, if someone, if, if an artist is really great, I've done it and I've loved it because it's really fun either writing for or with someone. That's always fun. But um, just writing something and putting it out there, hoping someone will cover it. I, I mm -hmm. don't I don't really feel it these really? days. Yeah. You want to you hit it really big? Write a Christmas tune. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the only the only one of the only covers I ever had from another artist was a Christmas song I wrote. 
Really? Yeah, with Trisha Yearwood. You're kidding me. I didn't know that. It was it was a song called Getting Ready for Christmas Day. And it wasn't on the charts. It was for a uh, an animated uh, ABC TV special called The Tangerine Bear. And uh, this is 20 years ago or whatever. And uh, yeah, that's like the only. Well, I, I have another another Christmas song I wrote with someone else, but I'm 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 not a fan to put it mildly of Christmas music. So I just, you know, it 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 reminds me a lot of times of Christmas music. Remember when disco was really big back in the seventies, mm-hmm. and disco yeah. is great. Yeah, disc. I love the music and all the songs and and whatever. When it started getting annoying was when every because it was so big, all the pop and rock guys decided they needed to do disco songs. And there was some god awful stuff put out there, you know, whether it was Rod Stewart or the Stones or, it or was Kiss, just Kiss, Chris, <laughs> yeah, Kiss Miss or whatever that was. But um, uh, and it reminds me that now with Christmas music, it's mm-hmm. like everyone wants to get so everyone puts out makes Christmas song Prague Christmas or whatever, <laughs> and and it just seems like they're trying to cash in on it, and yeah. it's just most of it's just god awful to my ears anyway. Um, yeah, I'm I'm. Yeah, to put it the least, I'm not a fan of Christmas music. I w- I would be happy if they did Christmas like the uh, like the Olympics once every four years. And you can yeah. only play Christmas music <laughs> on the week of Christmas. I'd be fine with it then. But I'm already starting to hear it now. Yeah, I started hearing it a few days ago before Halloween. Now I'm hearing Christmas. I know music. that's that's ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just find it all very annoying. The the two worst Christmas songs by legendary artists have to be Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. I hate that song. Santa yeah. Claus is coming today. And Paul McCartney. Oh, you, you, I, I've got an argument about that one. The moon is really? up. Da, 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 I can't stand it. that song. I mean, is, he could have done a, much better. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah, it's Paul McCartney. And yeah. that's a horrible song, and a lot of people love it. It's it's just it's grating, and it's uh, cringe-inducing, to me anyway, yeah. of all the great stuff he's done. Exactly. He, I, yeah. he didn't put any I mean, effort into it, you know? Oh, yeah. And neither did Springsteen. <laughs> no, I'm, Springsteen, I'm sure it was one of those deals like they were playing around Christmas. Hey, let's work up something. It'll be fun. <laughs> you know, I'm sure it was that, and all of a sudden it's a classic, you know? Exactly. So, yeah. And then, of course, Jose Feliciano did a very simple song that hit it big. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for it's these, huge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got I got a couple of songwriting questions for you. First of all, what's the best part of being a songwriter, and what's the worst part of being a songwriter? Um, the best part I think is getting something right where you know it's good, and you finish a song, and you and you think, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted to say. I'm really happy with the way this turned out, and and you listen to it a month later and it's still good, you know, because sometimes you just get kind of wrapped up in something and you're thinking it's good. That type of thing is the best. The worst is when you're working on a song. I don't really, I don't get writer's block at all Mm -hmm. uh, ever. And, but I'll go through a period where I'll like, I want to say a period, like a day. Well, I'll write, Mm -hmm. I'll start writing a song and it's just not working and you're struggling at it. Right. I'm trying to write lyrics and nothing's working. It gets really frustrated. At that point, I just usually junk it. I don't even try and come back to it. Hmm. That's that's the worst. Um, there are something, it depends, because there are sometimes you write something, you think, I'm not feeling it now, but this is a good part. I'm going to hang on to this right? Uh, because I can use it somewhere. But there are sometimes you write something, you know, when do you come back the next day and you just think, well, that sucks. And, <laughs> and, so, and, and so I just hit the erase button. I just delete the file because I, I don't want, I have so much other stuff. I don't want yeah. stuff cluttering up my brain. So that's gone. And even if I wanted to, I couldn't come, come back to that song. That, that happens every once in a while. So your, your gut is telling you a lot, basically. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the other thing is when I'm recording or writing for Pattern Seeking Animals, if I'm working on a song, uh, because sometimes I write songs quickly. Sometimes I do them over months, you know, a little bit at a time. And for example, I'll be writing a song and I'll be going through it and there'll come a section where I'll just skip it to get to the next section. And usually at that point, I think, well, if I'm skipping it, people listening are going to want to skip it. And I just cut the section out. Uh, it's mm-hmm. gone. Um, because uh, it's very easy to to develop demo love where you love everything you do. And uh, and uh you you can't bear to throw anything away but luckily f- fortunately enough for me is that i write a lot so i'm i can t- 
toss stuff away. And who knows, maybe I've thrown away things which yeah. have been, would have been great. I know. But, you know, you just kind of have to do it rather than, you know, you know, rather than have boring parts or what yeah. else, whatever I consider boring. But then again, on songs on these albums, songs which I think are the best, people don't like, and vice versa. Songs I, you know, sometimes I think, oh, that's okay, and people love them. So you never know because you, know, you get too close to everything. Well, you're you're obviously well read. You do a lot of, uh, you yeah. know, you're into movies and this and that, whatever. How much um, is research involved in your songwriting? Is or is it? Um, I wouldn't say research specifically for a song, um, but uh, uh, I read a lot and I, you know, whether it's the internet or books or whatever I do, um, if I come across an idea or a concept or something, I'll write it down. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, there's something, you know, the great molasses flood in Boston of 1906, or whatever that was, or something to go back to. And I might want to write a song. Um, I don't necessarily research a song while I'm writing it, but I, a, as I'm reading, I definitely write things down or jot things down or think, you know, um, uh, yeah. So just sometimes I'm just trying to think if I've ever gone back and researched, maybe, maybe I'll do something if I'm writing a song and I'm trying to come up with another angle, I might read about something similar just to try and jog, you know, jog the mm -hmm. creative part of my brain, but, uh, research now. A lot of concept albums are because of research, you know, they, well, yeah. something sparks them and they write a whole concept album based on one subject, you know, yeah. which is kind of cool. Oh yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. Concept albums. I, I try writing them, but I've started a couple and mm -hmm. what happens is I get two or three songs in and realize I've said everything I want to say about the subject. Mm -hmm. And there's still like, you know, a half an hour to go of material and it's like okay well screw that i can't i can't i can't stretch this one out you know like that's not gonna happen so what, what was your first concert that you ever went to uh first concert was uh let's see what's it was i think i was i was 15 mm -hmm. and it was rod stewart and the faces uh cobo hall in detroit which was great and the only reason mm -hmm. i went to that is because I was playing, you know, that every picture tells a story, mm -hmm. which I, I love that album. And my dad, who wasn't into, you know, a lot of the stuff I listened to, he really liked that album. I think a lot because I really? had, had all the mandolin and it was mm -hmm. more of an acoustic album. So he bought me and my brothers and my mom tickets when we went to see Rod Stewart. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Great dad. So that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, and we had good tickets. So and it was a great concert, my first real, you know, big, big show. Um, <laughs> Was I think it was the group family that opened up for him. I yeah. don't remember. And and then the next and with but about a week later, I went to saw yes. Went to see yes. Um when they put out close to the edge. That oh wow. So that was a second great one. time. Yeah, and that was that yeah. was me and my my buddies, you know, at the time. And from right. there I just saw a zillion different diff, different shows. My my dad went with me before I could drive. Um he saw Santana with dad. And you know, this is back like 71, you know, still hippies around and whatever. And back then yeah. you could smoke pot as much as you want at a oh, concert. Yeah. You know, right yeah. now it's like a, you can't because of the smoking violations and all that other crap. Right. Yeah. But they, they used to hand their uh, pipes to dad so he could light them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, mister, can you light, light my yeah. bong and my pipe here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah right. <laughs> it's it pretty right. funny. Yeah. And, and he took me to, um, this was a, in Baltimore. I saw um, it was Rare Earth, yeah. the Funkadelics, and the Ohio play. Ohio I've, I've players. seen all those. Rare Earth is from Detroit. Yep, they yeah, are the from drummer, Detroit. Motown. Drummer. Yeah, yep. and the drummer I can't remember his name, but he was Pete. A singer. Pete Rivera. Pete Rivera. Yeah, and, yeah. I saw, I saw, I saw them, and um, yeah, Parliament and Funkadelic. All those guys. I saw all those, <laughs> all those. I saw all those groups. So you're <laughs> from Michigan originally? Yeah, I did, grew up in Detroit. Oh, right really? Yeah. yeah. Great music, man. All the oh, yeah. garage bands, you know. Oh, MC5 and uh, Mark Farner and Grand Funk. Mark Farner, mm -hmm. Ted yeah. Nugent and the Amboy Dukes, you know, yeah. all that great stuff. Yeah. Susie Quattro. Susie Quattro, yeah. And all and the Mike girls. Quattro. Mike yeah. Quattro. Mike yeah. Quattro, who is like a keyboard kind of proggy guitar, or rather keyboard player. Right. Lesser known. 
I know Susie and I know Pete Rivera. I know all those cool. guys. Oh, yeah. cool. And Mark Farner. I know Mark. He's yeah. been on the show many, many times. He's such a great guy. Love Mark. Yeah, I remember it was uh who was the keyboard player in uh Frost? Was it Craig Frost? Yeah, Craig yeah. Frost, right. Yeah, and yeah, because they yeah, they were from up in Flint. Yeah, Michigan, a little north and little Mark north still lives Flint, in Flint. Right. Oh yeah, I yeah. Exactly. So um yeah, they're from Flint. So yeah, I would see them a bunch. Um God, yeah, there's just a ton of different, you know. I live in the uh Sarasota area in Florida. Right. Yeah. And we got so many people from Michigan here. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah. This, yeah, we got a ton of them out here in California too. Yeah, Is that right? People, really? Half the half the people I meet out here are from, you know, Michigan or Ohio or Illinois or you know Kentucky, yeah. whatever. Everyone comes here. Minnesota. Yeah. No, a lot of people from Minnesota. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Do, do, do you have any other interest outside of music? You know, that's pretty much my main thing. Is it? I, yeah, I just really, I'm, I'm really into it. I, you know, like the usual, mm -hmm. um, going out with friends to eat or con, not concerts, but you know, whatever, eat, going out to eat, um, hiking, just mm -hmm. whatever the usual stuff. I got to tell you, man, you look great. I mean, you're about a year or two older than me, and you look, you look great. No wrinkles. Yeah. Well, I've had, know? I've, I've had a baby face forever, which was, which is great now. But right. back when I was a teenager, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> trying out for a band and i was 19 and the only reason i didn't get it because the main the guy this this group playing clubs all around detroit he says yeah i can't have you in the band you look like you're 12 <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that, that you know it's stuck in my brain to this day it was actually you couldn't kind of grow funny. a beard a beard oh, or a mustache no. God, no? <laughs> no no not even close at that point yeah That's no funny. i just look like i just had the baby face so <laughs> yeah all right. Yeah. Here's your so, final question. Here's a question I ask everybody. Can I can I hold on one sure. second? Hold yeah, on no second. problem. No problem. Go for it. Good morning. Hello. From Lisa Todd. Oh, thank you much. Have a great day. See you around. Okay. Yeah, I was expecting that I tried to drop that off. Okay. Something off like all morning and he finally showed up. So Perfect. I can edit that out. Not a problem. Oh, that's fine. Okay. All right. So if you had a field of dreams wish like the movie to perform, collaborate uh, with anybody from the past or present, who would that be? I've been asked this question. I No one. No one. <laughs> no, because I, I, it's not that I don't think other people are incredibly talented or you know, fantastic at what they do. It's just that I always think, why would anyone at that level want to collaborate with me? Mm -hmm. And realistically, when you're collaborating, at some level, you're watering down your idea for a song. Right. I mean, it might be fun, you know, to sit mm -hmm. down with, you know, Paul McCartney, obviously. I mean, no question about it. But I, I just wonder, because collaboration a lot of time has to be organic, not just mm -hmm. thrown together with someone. Mm -hmm. You know, you could throw together your perfect, whether it's, you know, who knows, Phil Collins, and I could walk in and for some reason, something about me would annoy him and there wouldn't be a connection. <laughs> you know, it, it has to be, very, it has to be organic, I think, that stuff. Right. And I don't have anyone, although I'd be open to doing it, but I think it might be just a random person at a random e event or something. I'm, I'm not even sure on that one. Hmm. I really think you'd be a great songwriter for other artists as well. Well, but, I've written in the, like I said, I've written in the past, you know, country and pop stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I have a, a guy, in fact, on the last album, there was a song uh, called Just Another Day at the Beach, mm -hmm. which I wrote with uh, my friend Stanley, who I've been writing country stuff with for 30 years. Wow. So that that's someone I wrote with all the time, but he's a friend of mine and I've known him and we work together great. And, um, but just being thrown in the, thrown in with uh, a, a stranger, no matter how mm. talented or great they were, uh, you know, it might work out great. It might not, but it's just something that doesn't really, doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, if Taylor Swift came to me and said, let's write a song together, I would be an idiot not to, because, you know, immediately <laughs> I, it's, that would be retirement money, you yeah. know, that kind of stuff. And yeah. plus I, I think she's, she's as close to a genius as there is these days in music. But um, I, I don't, 
you know, it's not something which I think, God, I wish I could write with Taylor Swift, or I wish I could write with uh, Paul McCartney, or I wish I could, whatever, Paul Simon, whatever. Mm -hmm. I saw uh, another guy that you're talking about all these songwriters. Barry Manilow was incredible. Yeah. He was, he was a great songwriter, you know? Right. That's one oh, guy yeah. I'd like to see in concert that I've never seen. He's I've always liked his songs, and he wrote a lot of jingles. Me too. You know, all those yeah. J jingles. And yeah. Yeah, he's, he's written a lot of killer songs. You know, ironically, the the song, I write the songs, he didn't write. He, he didn't, didn't write, write that. that. That's no, right. Bruce Johnson. <laughs> Beach Boys. But uh, um, no, he's yeah, he's he was a super talented guy. And he's, he just played around here somewhere. I did think he? he did maybe the Hollywood Bowl or, or he's going to. Hmm. Yeah, he's always been good. <clears throat> I, I saw a special about Dolly Parton too. She's an incredible songwriter yeah. as well. A lot of people don't realize how many songs she's written over the years. All you, you, know? all you have to know about Dolly Parton mm -hmm. is uh, the song uh, Jolene, mm -hmm. which is a classic of all times. Right. And the song, I will, I will love you. You know, the, mm -hmm. that um, Whitney Houston did. Yeah. She wrote both of those songs. She did. Not only did she write both of those songs, she wrote them both in the same day. And, just right there is, you know, it's just that's God level songwriting. That is know, so damn good. Really no, is. she's, I've always liked her. She's been, she was in that group, you know, trio with Linda Ronstadt and Emmylou mm -hmm. Harris, which I loved. Love that. You know, or, you know, Dolly is, uh, Dolly's great. I was on a, uh, a press conference call with Dolly, uh, Emmy Lou, and Linda Ronstadt. It was really cool. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> They were funny too. <laughs> Very hilarious. Yeah, I've always been a fan of all three of, of them. So uh yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, all I got. Is there anything okay. that, that that I miss? Anything that coming up for pattern seeking animals or not really Spock's just, beard? Oh, I don't Spock's beard, I'm not in that loop anymore. No so more, I'm, huh? No more Spock's no, beard. I'm, no, I'm I'm gone. Yeah, okay. that was one of those things where um things were getting uh uh, crowded because there's so many songwriters yeah. and I wasn't really happy and I'm sure they weren't happy with me. Um, but, uh, and so the last album, I just decided that's all I was going to okay. do with them. You're, no you're hard good, feelings. Though. You're good at it. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. Cause I wrote a lot of the material. The yeah. last couple albums, I wrote a lot of the music on mm -hmm. those last few albums, but, but no, nothing personal about anything. It's just, you know, logistically and, um, you know, from from a musician standpoint, it's I I like better working on my own at this point. Right. Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I want to say very special thanks to Royal Avenue Media for arranging this interview with John. Roy. Yep. Um, you can purchase the latest release by Pattern Seeking Animals, Spooky Action at a Distance. And it is available now. It's available now wherever yeah. fine music is sold or streamed that uh, is available in LP or yep. CD digipack or digital download or streaming. It's all over the place. The great album, man. I love Thank it. You. Thank you, you guys are available on uh, your official website. PS. Yes. If you want to know. Yeah. Yep. Go PS, ahead. PS animals, animals, one, the number one, mm -hmm. uh, dot com. Yep. And, or our Facebook page, just pattern seeking animals. And you can find out where to buy everything or hear other stuff there too. Also, Twitter, Instagram, Twitter, Instagram, all the socials. Um, haven't done TikTok yet, but um, yeah, it's kind of weird, you know. I all my videos are too long, so I can't, I can't yeah, I, you know, publish I, them. I love TikTok. I love watching yeah. stuff, but I think yep. realistically, because for example, Stephen Wilson mm -hmm. is on TikTok, right? And uh, which I follow and I watch his stuff, but he might have four thousand, you know, four thousand. Uh, people who are, are subscribed to him and listen to him and then you'll get you know some girl who makes you know balloon animals look like uh you know they'll the look like fish and she has three million subscribers it's, it's a crazy. very it's an age it's a it's a it's an age thing you know it is an age thing i know so i just figured what's the point of putting this stuff? you know billy sheehan i know billy and yeah. uh, he's he has a he has a um uh, uh, uh tick tock but it doesn't really uh doesn't he doesn't have you know 30 years ago any of these people would have millions of subscribers, but it's, I think it's just an age thing and an yeah. age gap where it's a younger person's yeah. game on TikTok. But you know, the other stuff I'm, yeah, all that stuff I'm into. Instagram is good because you can post yeah. all these great pictures yep. of the band and all that yep. stuff. Yep. Yeah. John, yeah. thank you, man, for being on the show today, especially the second time around. 
<laughs> yeah, the second time around. Exactly. Yeah, and I'm going to publish this tonight so nothing happens to it. <laughs> Perfect. Make sure you got to record it. Otherwise, I'll be back a third time. No, yeah. no, no. We're yeah. good. I appreciate it. But, cool. you know, the, when the next album comes out, you know, the, we'll, yeah. we'll have you on the we'll show talk. again. Definitely cool. for sure. Cool. All right, appreciate John. It. Thanks, man. It's Thank been, it's been a real pleasure. Absolutely. Take Later. care. Bye-bye.